This morning I'd like to talk to you about prodigals and how important they are to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Last night as I was just thinking about this particular chapter that we're going to read in a uh, portion of it in Luke 15 verses 11 to 32, I felt the Holy Spirit just nudge my mind and say, you all begin as prodigals. We all begin as prodigals in the sense that we are apart from God, separated from God. And uh, some of us are blessed with parents that raise us up in the Lord, but we still have to make this conscious decision to be able to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Some do as young kids, and then they kind of go out and sow their wild oats. And they really live as a prodigal, try to do it their own way. Try to do it without God. But if they are, uh, have in their hearts sown the word of God, the Bible says, the backslider has it full of their ways. We're going to read about a prodigal here, and then I'm going to read you an article written by an author, a woman who uh, kind of hits, uh, hits the nail right on the head concerning how we should never give up on our children no matter what because we believe that God has a few pointers for us today and he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? Amen. So let's just begin reading in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. We're going to break into some of the parables of Jesus. And this one is the parable of the lost son or the prodigal. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus continued... There was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got uh, together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed, to, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found so began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your father has come, or your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, but you never gave me even one young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you for this story of the prodigal. We ask, Lord God, that we can learn from this, Lord God, that number one, we could learn, Lord, that we all begin as prodigals. And some of us have longer extended stays 
in a faraway country, Lord God, and not the kingdom of God, but your desire, Lord, is for all, Lord, to come to salvation. For you so loved the world that you gave his, your only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You sent the son into the world not to condemn anybody, but through the son, the whole world could be saved. Open our eyes, open our ears, help us to make room in our hearts for prodigals all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone says amen. Now, most of us have heard the story about the prodigal. There's a couple of questions that come up. Number one, well, why did the father allow the son to leave and give him all of this wealth? It's because of free will. God gives us all a free will. We have children we try to raise them up in the ways of the Lord, but sometimes they go astray and they become a prodigal. Why? Because they have free will. We can't force our children to do anything. We can try to encourage them. We could teach them the best we can. But they're on their own when it comes to making the personal decision to come back to the Father's house and to be able to serve the Lord. They have to make this decision. God has no grandchildren, as the saying goes. We must be born again, or we cannot enter the kingdom of God. But we have to realize this, too. It's not a question of, well, I'm better than the other person. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. There's just a time delay with some, some prodigals. Some, some are only a prodigal until they reach four or five years old, and they serve the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, serve God the rest of their lives. But some remain prodigals for a very, very long time. And we have to remember, never discard anybody as junk. Because God does not make junk. Amen. Amen? He doesn't make, he gave us all who believe in his name the right and the authority to become children of God no matter what they have done in their past. And Jesus sets this, this story down in this parable to show that even an individual who has been living a life of the grossest sins, if he finally comes to his senses, and when he finally comes to his senses, he can come home. And rather than the father make him a second-class citizen, he says, come home, you're still my son. Two last points before I read you this wonderful article on prodigals. Number one, the son was always a son to the father. Number two, the prodigal was not always a brother to the elder brother because the elder brother cut him off. Why? It's because the prodigal had a very poor performance as a son. So therefore, he felt as if he doesn't deserve anything. But you notice that the father ran to his son when he saw him. And it's very, very clear in God's eyes who is saved and who is lost. It's very, 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 very clear. Before we come to Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sin. And when the elder brother tried to talk about religious performance and duties and things like that, the father just cut him short. He says, listen, your brother was once dead, but now he is alive. And that should speak volumes to us when we think of somebody who's in trouble, somebody who's in sin, somebody who walked away from God, somebody who you trusted in, somebody who betrayed you. We have to realize that God loves the world and he sent Jesus and whoever believes in him will not perish. Because there's a tremendously long delay in an individual's life, I've seen some prodigals on their deathbed at 70, 80 years old finally receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And they're going to heaven. What kind of performance did they have? Well, I hear their confessions. And they're saying, I was a rotten, I was a rotten person. I couldn't do nothing right. I destroyed my family. I haven't seen anyone. When I die, no one will come to my funeral except maybe the devil. And I say, no, no. Jesus will be there. You're getting saved this day. And I have to convince them many times because they think they're not worthy of heaven. Just like every prodigal after they've lived such a horrible life, they feel that God will not receive them back. But I'm letting you know that God and his love never fails. Can you say that with me? God's love, God's love. never fails. We fail at love. But God's love never fails. 
and he will never fail you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe that? Lori Hatcher is an author. She's a mother, and uh, she's an empty nester. Her kids are grown now, and, and she uh, ministers with her husband. And she wrote this tremendous article entitled, For Mothers of Prodigals, Six Reasons to Keep Hoping. And since we're between Mother's Day and Father's Day, I'd like to kind of like just say it's not only for mothers, but it's also for fathers too. So let me just break into the article because she's a very good writer and I think you'll enjoy this story. Mother's Day has come and gone. Thank God, some women say. You may have noticed them wiping their eyes in church while the sweet, sappy, I love you, Mom, you're the best, video played. They weren't crying because they were touched by the sentimentality of the footage. They were crying because their hearts were breaking. They were wondering if they'd ever hear their adult children say, I love you, Mom, again. They were looking at someone else's child holding up a finger-painted card and wondering what went wrong with their own. They were watching the gangly preteen read a carefully written prayer thanking God for mothers and remembering their own children's most recent words which were anything but thankful. And instead of hurrying to collect their children from the nursery after service, they rushed home hoping to find a message on their voicemail, only to be disappointed again. They are the mothers of prodigals. If you are one of the ones who cried during that video for all the wrong reasons, I have six things to say to you. Number one, God cries for prodigals too. He wept over Jerusalem, which he longed to gather to his breast, and, and he wept over the adulterous Gomer, who he wanted to heal and restore. God weeps for your children too. Number two, God is sovereign over rebellion. Jonah was running hard away from God. Hard. But God saw him, pursued him, chastised him, and won him back. But Jonah went, ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And that's in Jonah chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights, we could have added until he came to his senses. God knows exactly where your child is, and he can engineer circumstances large and small to pursue him or her and win him back. Sometimes it's the goodness of God that leads our children to repentance, and sometimes it's his judgment. We can trust God to know which is more effective. Then number three, there are no perfect parents. At night, the voices whisper loudly. You lost your temper a lot. You didn't pray enough. You didn't take them to church enough. You took them to church too often. You sent them to private school. You sent them to Christian school. You homeschooled them. It's all your husband's fault. If you married someone else, it would have been different. These are all lies. Adam and Eve had a perfect parent, and they still chose to go their own way. James 1 verse 14 explains how each bears the responsibility for their own choices and his own sin, including our prodigal children. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. And number four, God can use the sins of others, including you, to accomplish his purpose in your child's life. If you sinned against your child, and we all have, either intentionally or unintentionally, God is sovereign even over that sin. But if someone else has sinned against your child, God is sovereign over that as well. Some of us came to Christ late and lived a godless example in front of our children. Other, although we've repented, forsaken, and 
uh, ask forgiveness of God in our children, we find it hard to forgive ourselves. Other times we see events in our children's lives outside our control and wonder if those events push them over the prodigal precipice. The story of Joseph should give us hope. Listen to what he said to his brothers as they stood before him in guilt and fear over their sinful actions. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what was now being done, the saving of many lives. And that's in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You see, Joseph understood that while God didn't cause the sin that changed his life forever, he was able to use the sin to accomplish something good. He can do the same for our children. Number five, God can restore and redeem your prodigal. The Apostle Paul gives me great hope. He spent a significant portion of his life far from God doing wicked things. When God saved him, however, he turned the world upside down for Christ. And then in Joel 2, verse 25, we read, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. And number six, the prodigal should not steal your joy or your faith. There will be times when you feel as though your heart is breaking, when you wonder if you can climb out of bed and face another day, and when your thoughts and mind are consumed with the thoughts of your prodigal child, where is he? Is he safe? Who is he with? Those thoughts are normal and should be your impetus to pray and pray hard. If we allow our children's rebellion to strip us of our faith and joy, however, we might be guilty of idolatry. Am I worshiping my children instead of worshiping God? Do I value them so much that their absence can strip me of my faith, of my ability to experience joy, of my desire to serve and worship God? Some of the darkest times of my parenting life have also been some of the sweetest times of my spiritual life. When I come to God broken and helpless and frightened and weak, he meets me there. He speaks words of healing to my heart. He becomes my mighty warrior. He quiets my frightened spirit and strengthens my troubling soul or trembling soul. When I feel as though everything precious has been stripped away, I discover that the greatest treasure remains. The prophet Habakkuk describes what steadfast faith looks like. In Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 18, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there is no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God and my Savior. Broken-hearted mama, it's okay to cry, but cry in the arms of your Savior. Don't be afraid to ask him for great and mighty things on behalf of your child. Trust him for a miracle. And remember that nothing is too hard for him. That's by Lori Hatcher. Isn't that a beautiful story? Making room in our hearts for prodigals. It's not only for parents, but for all of us. Because last night, when I was at home with the Lord, the Lord said, I have many prodigals. I have sons and daughters. In fact, as, he, as I began to say in the beginning, we all begin as prodigals. We all begin as prodigals. Some, fish, some people are, I call them artificial Christians, where they, they grow up in a church, but they never really were saved. And when they reach these rebellious years, they're turning away from God because we forced them to do something they never wanted to do. You can't force a pig to become an eagle. You cannot force a, a cow to become a rabbit. You can't force anyone to do anything. Because it's with our free will that we finally get to the place where we've come to our senses to realize that we need God. We need him. And everyone, each in his own time and each in his own order. But we can help. And how can we help? By doing these things that Lori had spoken about in this article. But never forget this, that God is sovereign. And what I want to do this morning, and I felt this in my heart, 
the Lord said, son, I want you to pray for all of the prodigals, and I want each and every family member here that has a prodigal in your family. It could be your child. It could be someone in your family. Or it could be somebody who's your best friend. They're still a prodigal and they don't know God. Never stop praying for their salvation. That's what the church should be doing today. I love to party in Jesus. I love to see people having a great time in God. But I never forget where I came from. And I never forget the fact that my mother uh, was praying for me constantly as she watched me dying from just, just not caring anymore. Being a, uh, just an individual who had too much at too young of an age. All the money I could ever want and spend. All the friends I could ever want to be with. All of the power. All of the, to be able to go anywhere in the world, wherever you wanted to do. All up until the age of 24 years old. And then at that time, I didn't care if I lived or died anymore because I've done it all. But the one thing I could not do is to be happy with whatever I had gained. And I didn't realize at that time that God got me to a place where after I got to the top of the mountain, I realized that the only place to go was down. And I went down. You see, when your body finally gives out and when your mind gives out and you realize that, why should I live any longer? Just eat and drink and be merry and just drug myself to death. What is the difference? But I had a mother who did not give up praying. And she constantly prayed. She was a good Catholic lady and prayed to the patron saint of hopeless cases. Okay? I always like to say my mom probably and dad probably built most of St. Jude's Children's Hospital. You see, they cared about all of these children, but they watched as myself just ended up becoming destroyed by just all of living a wanton life, just giving myself over to doing whatever I wanted to do with all the money in the world. But then you get to the place where you can't do it anymore because your body gives out and your mind is giving out. Now, most of you will never get to that place. And I pray, God, that you never be in a prodigal to the place where you're on your deathbed where you have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I can tell you that even if you do get to that place, that God will take you into heaven. As Mickey Mantle once said, if I knew I was going to live as long as I would, I would have taken care, of more, taken care of more of my body. And I never realized that I would live as long as I'm living right now because God did heal my stomach problems. He healed my, my, all the, the health problems that I had gotten from all of the things that I had done wrong. He healed my spirit and set me free from all the satanic things that I got involved with during the hippie days and where we were just trying everything once. He set me free from all of these things. And then he showed me what new life was all about. And I'm telling you right now that Jesus ran to me. All I had to do is say, Father, I have sinned. And you got every right to send me to hell. But Lord God, if you give me one more chance, I'll do it right by your grace. I am sorry for everything I did. I cannot right any wrongs. I can, can't unscramble an egg, but I can stop scrambling them as best I can if you give me one more chance. Little did I realize that that was my altar call. That was my time of seeking God with all of my heart. And he came and he set me free. And he, he took me from the gutter and he lifted me up to the uttermost in him and filled me with his Holy Spirit. And then he said to me, son, as I have done for you, you go and tell others about my great power and my grace and my love for them. And he showed me things in the Bible about his love. I could not believe how much God does love this world. We make this world because we allow sin to grab us and selfishness and, and evil to grip our hearts to the place where we put on the front that we're really, really, you know, true and we're really, really uh, loving. But in reality, we're just act as animals do on this earth, using each other. With once in a while, we do some nice things, nice things. But when God gets a hold of your life and you realize that you truly are a son, a truly are a daughter of God, with his divine nature is within your heart, his divine nature is flooding through your, blains, your, your, your veins right now, and his thinking comes upon you, you begin to think like Jesus Christ. You begin to act like Jesus Christ. You feel like you swallowed the son of the living God, and there's a smile on your face, and the things you do is not because you want to get something from somebody, but it's because you're radiating out the presence of God. God can do nothing except give. That's all he can do. He's like the sun. He can just give. The sun gives and gives and gives. That's all he can do is God gives himself away and that's what he wants to do for you. That's what this article about is the prodigal son. 
I can always tell if someone is living under the law or living under grace by how they interpret scriptures. I really can. I can tell people how they love just by the way they act and by the way they see scriptures and what scriptures are called to their mind when they're thinking about. If they find out that somebody fell, some person who was living a good life and they were a representative of maybe even in the church and all of a sudden some personal thing comes out and, and they messed up. You can always tell who the ones really know the love of God and who are still under the law. Because the ones that are under the law are the first ones that condemn. The first ones are shocked in their mind as if, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that somebody could sin in our church as if none of us sin. The only difference is that we judge people just because they sin differently than we do. It's called holier than thou. And when God looks down, he looks at all of us as sinners saved by his grace only. He looks at all of us as a prodigal. He looks at all of us in different stages of development. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I labor in prayer. I labor for you in prayer. And I hope and I believe that one day Christ will be formed in you. That your minds would be renewed. And it's a process that takes place. This is not a contest down here in the church to see who's the holiest one. Who can get out of this world without ever doing some public scandal or some public skin, uh, 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 sin. When in reality we all have private sins going on in our minds and in our private life at times. Because we have these animal bodies that have desires that absolutely just act like animals at times. And we try to curve them with our thinking and curve them with the word of God. But like the Apostle Paul, we end up just saying, oh, who is going to save me from this wretched? I don't understand myself at all. I want to do the very things that God's word says to do. I, with my mind I want to serve God, but with my flesh I end up serving sin. It's because sin is in the body. And that's why we die, if you haven't found that out. The body is dead because of sin. That's what Paul found out. But it did not stop him from trying to live the best life he could. It did not stop him from being able to go forth and talk about the holiness and the character of Jesus Christ. And it did not stop him from being able to talk about the grace of God. For when he was weak, he said, I am strong. My strength, God says, is made perfect in your weakness. Just like the Father took the prodigal's weakness and scandal life and he swallowed it up with a feast and he just said simply hey my son was dead but now he's alive this message is for you too if you feel like a dead man walking or a dead girl walking or you feel like you've ruined your life you feel like people will never accept you because of what you've done in the past listen people you'll never please everybody all the time you can't please human beings. They're so fickle. They're a pain in the neck sometimes when we're trying to deal with humans. They're with you for a while and then they leave you. But God will never leave you and he will never forsake you and he'll take you through the storms of life. And where do you meet him? You meet him right at Golgotha. You meet him at the cross because that's where new life begins with a death to self and a new life risen on the third day. You rise from the dead with the power of the Holy Spirit within you and then you can do what Jesus did. Every time somebody betrays you, every time somebody sins against you, and the first thing that rises up within us is vengeance. We want justice. And God says, no, forgive them for they don't know what they do. I like to summarize it up and people get angry at me. If I say, we're all idiots down here. We all have an idiotic tendency time sometimes to misinterpret situations where it could be a place where we could actually snatch somebody from the fire, what we do is we heap more coals of fire on their heads by throwing more judgment as if we are so much holier than them. But ringing in my heart is this whole idea of Jesus saying, go into all the world and preach the good news. And those who believe will be saved. They'll pass out of death and right into life because it's not based upon your performance. It's the based upon if you accept, believe that God sent the Son to die on the cross for your sins. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. That's the gospel. You believe that, you're saved. To the religious and the elder brothers, they don't like that. 
Why? It's because they've been trying to perform for so long. And they got all their, they got their eggs in one basket. They got their ducks in a row as best they could. But they don't realize that God's not impressed with that. Because no matter how religious you look on the outside, there's still sin inside the nature. And when you try to paint the picture on the outside that everything is fine and you're better than everybody else, you're nothing but a Pharisee. And Jesus said, you're like a whited sepulcher. You go around dressed in the fancy clothes and praying so people can see the way you are. But inside, you're full of dead man bones. Because you're a sinner like everybody else. And that's why the sinners were drawn to Jesus because he said, we never heard a man speak like this. He's a preacher. We never heard somebody speak like this. We just hear these nicey nice professional messages that we got on Google looking at sermon helps or something like that. All the outlines, secondhand information. It's like leftover entomins that's been three weeks old and you can get it for a buck. It's really cheap. And you bite into it, well, it's almost as good. It's a little stale, but it's okay. No, I like my fresh manna from heaven. I like getting before Jesus and saying, God, you know who's coming today. Lord, put in my heart what can touch people's hearts so that they will be changed and become like you. Because I've been in this business a long time. I've seen them come. I've seen them go. And I've realized this, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and were saved simply by faith in Jesus Christ. And that we should love one another. That's what Jesus said. Love one another. And in all my years, I am reduced to this, that nobody can get me to the place where I will not love them anymore. But I don't have a down pat because i got a deal in my head, and I have to deal with calling people idiots and stupid and, and what a jerk. And then I go, I'm a jerk for saying what a jerk. Lord, forgive me. But this is between me and Jesus. I'm just confessing what you think probably too. I say this to the Lord. And I say, Lord, I can't wait until the day when you will take this corrupt body, and I will receive an incorrupt body. I will put on immortality, and I will always think the way you think. I will always love the way you love. I will always see the way you see. But until then, God, your strength is made perfect in my weakness. So I'll take my weaknesses and I'll turn them over to you, Jesus. And I will confess every single day the sins that I know. And Lord, the sins that I don't know I'm doing, I ask the Holy Spirit who lives within me, who teaches me all things, to teach me these things, that I might not sin against my God. But I know that if I do sin, I have an advocate. I have a mediator. And if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness because Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. He's coming back to the church for you and for me. Amen. He's coming back to the earth. I want you to think about a prodigal. It might be in your own family. It could be your son or daughter if you have children. It could be your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, your mother, or your father. A prodigal is somebody who's trying to do it on their own. And I remember speaking, I was only a save for a week. And I was involved in this revival, and I always stayed around afterwards. And, and I remember this guy looked like he was a guru from, you know, he had, you know, I, at first I thought he was like a, a monk, but then he wasn't. He said, no, no, I'm, you know, I just got back from India. And this is the days of the hippie days, and everybody was searching. I said, India? What were you doing in India? He said, I sat under a guru for two years. I said, what'd you learn? He said, well, for the first year, you know, I didn't learn anything. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk to me. He just said, just sit. So the second year, I asked him. You know, I said, well, you know, I'm try I've come to try to find the meaning of life. And what's it all about? Why are we here on this earth? And the guru said, I don't know. <laughs> he says, you don't know. What are all these people doing here? He says, we're all searching for the truth. He says, but I don't know the truth. I says, what are you doing back in America? He says, I ran out of money and I was kind of like disillusioned. He said, you know, but I'm still looking for truth. I said, you really are looking for truth? And this is for you listening to this message. You really want to know the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. I said this to this guy. I said, listen. Christ is the truth. Truth is not a book. Truth is not an ideology. It's not a religion. It's not a system. It's not a performance-based kind of concept. It's not a cult. It's not a group. It's not a country club. It's not any kind of a thing like that. But truth is a person. It is the very nature of God himself. 
He is truth. He cannot lie. He is the creator of all of the universe. And I said, if you really want to know the truth, you can know him. He says, I want to know him. And I said, then say this tonight. Jesus, this nut, I was kidding around, but I was a nut back then, you know, telling people about Jesus. I said, Jesus, this nut came to me and said that you will speak to me tonight and show me that you really are the truth. And I said, but you got to be honest. If you're just, you know, looking for more power and looking for this and to, you know, I said, nothing's going to happen. But if you really are sincere, he goes, I spent two years of my life searching. I said, well, your search is over because it's a person, Jesus. Go to him tonight. And if you go to him tonight and you just say, Jesus, if you are the truth, reveal yourself to me. And I said, but, I said, you've got to admit that you've sinned and that he's the only savior. And that was what got him. He goes, well, I don't know about that. I think there's many ways up the mountain. I said, hogwash. That's nothing but some religious psycho babble from human beings put this together. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I said, if you believe that and try, what do you got to lose? I said to him, I'm a pretty good salesman when it comes to Jesus. What do you got to lose? He goes, nothing. I said, but this is the way you got to pray. I said, you got to pray in this manner. You got to say, Jesus if you are the savior of the world, please convince me because I really want to know the truth. I sent him on his way. He did come back. I never even talked to him again, but I saw him. And he was just smiling, praising God. You see, this is all about a relationship with Jesus. It's not a relationship with the church or joining a country club. It's not about joining this church or another church or, wow, look at the size of that church. I'm going to join that. Why? Well, there's a lot of girls there, a lot of boys there. Oh, well, you know, hey, I'm a business person. I can get a lot of business if I join that church. As if it's a, if it's a country club. How many people ever were in a country club? Nobody? I never, I, I never went in. I was in country clubs quite a bit because I hung around with a lot of wealthy people. And I can tell you right now, the reason why the dues are so high is they don't want to, they want to keep the riffraff out. I've been in country clubs where the minimum fee to get in there a year is a half a million dollars. That's just the fee. You know why? Because they don't want anybody who's not making that much to get in there. Because they want to bring their families in there. They don't want their kids socializing with anybody that's below that stage. In other words, the top 1% of the world's income is where these people hang out. But you won't find them hanging out in the streets of India or even the streets of East Meadow. They, you won't find them going out and trying to, trying to touch people and trying to help them. You don't find that. Why? It's because that is the system of the world. The incredible thing is I could get really frustrated with that. But when I read the Bible, and I'm closing with this idea that God so loved the world. Ugh. Oh. If you love the world, then I got to love the world, Lord. I'd like to just go ahead and, and, and get 10 acres of land and grow my hair and look like one of your disciples and just not have any, any human contact with another human being, and then I could be holy. And I think the Holy Spirit laughs. He says, son, he said, I told you to go into all the world. I love people. And forget about arguing with God. How could you love some of these people? I mean, some of you are very difficult to love. You really are. Okay. <laughs> And I didn't even have to talk to your mate or the one sitting next to you. You know, I couldn't live with you, okay? I could love you. I could go to church with you, but I don't think I could live with half of you. And you couldn't live with me. I'd drive you out of your mind, okay? God gave me a good wife who understands me. But the fact is that God can live with each and every one of us personally. That's why he's God and I'm Rob. Would you stand to your feet right now? I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward, and I want to do something right now. Could you move that back? Everyone knows a prodigal. You might have one in your own family. It might be a friend. It might be a parent. Everyone that would like to come here and stand in proxy for your prodigal, we're going to pray for you as if they were that individual. You're going to stand for them, and we're going to pray and believe that God's going to move in a powerful way. And the musicians will play something softly behind us. But I want you to come up here. If you've got a prodigal somewhere, could be your anybody, a child, or it could be a family member, and you want to believe that God will touch them. I'm doing what Jesus told me to direct. 
He just told me to do that. He said, son, you call him up. I said, okay, I will. I thank God that I'm back with Jesus. I lived a long time as a Christian. And I can tell you right now, God is love.